When it comes to purchasing gold, we've got 2% of the population, 1% to 2% of the population that actually do that. It staggers me that governments and mainstream media have been that powerful that they've been able to take people's mind of investment-oriented people away from gold. Because in every other respect, gold is the ultimate. You'd think everyone would own it. Just your response to that. Uh, it's an interesting point. I mean, it's 0.5% of global financial assets. It is an inherently scarce, scarce asset. Its stock to flow ratio is less than 58. It's 2% production a year. It's a finite asset with an infinite duration. And there's a reason it's not just a, a symbol of sports awards or golden relationships or golden metrics. It's not just a barbaric relic that sits in the ground and you pay a fee uh-huh. to watch. There's it's a monetary metal. And to your question, why doesn't everyone get this? Well, in some ways, I remember during reading David Stockman's book, again, during the, the crisis in 89 and the Nikkei, when Japan went from the, the, the sun that never set, the rising sun that never set, to an implosion in 89. The Nikkei uh, saw massive losses 30 years later, has not recovered. But there was a saying in Tokyo in the late 80s that how can we all get hurt if we're crossing the street together? There was this herd mentality, this group thing that it's let's think alike, just like over the top at Verdun or Gallipoli. Let's just march up the hill and it, you get massacred. It's it's there's safety in numbers. There's safety in the RAA industrial complex that tells you a risk parity portfolio of stocks and bonds will save you. Bonds will not save you. They're correlated to, to assets like like equities now. The traditional portfolios will not save you. But it's very, very hard to stand apart from a group and question something. But no time in history, whether it was Australia in 1914 or 2023 or London or New York, did anyone who bought gold regret having gold? No time. In the Civil War in the South, if you were in Virginia, you were much before your gold of your Confederate Jeff Davis dollar. Hmm. It's interesting, the the attempt um, to discredit or at least omit gold from the conversation. Hmm. because It is the number one threat. Um, to government currencies. Yep. And, and we haven't had a chance to talk about central bank digital currencies or the E-dollar, the E-N, or the Great Reset. But all of these things to have any credibility are already talking about having some coverage by gold because I think more and more people realize there's no credibility without it. But yet, to your point, it is fascinating. Mm. Uh, where, where we deal in Switzerland with very high net worth clients, and of course I can't give you their names or their amounts, It's not a surprise to me, though, that folks who've made money in Bitcoin or Wall Street are spending lots and lots of money on physical gold. Um, You don't have to be a millionaire in Zurich or Davos or Gestad to be smart. And you can buy coins right there in Melbourne or in Sydney or in St. Louis or in Detroit or in Chicago. And I've never, never met someone. Maybe they're not happy that the price has moved ahead, but, you know, an ounce of gold will still buy the same suit. On, uh, in, on, you know, in London that it did 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and 300 years ago, but $100 will not buy the same suit. So it, again, it's common sense. It's not gold bugging. It's not pushing a product. It's com- rallying today. It's up around 3% at the time of this interview, back over 1900. Mm-hmm. So what is the impact on the gold market here? Well, again, there's so many forces affecting the gold market. And, you know, we can talk about that too long. And I could get too long into it. I think the main thing I think about gold, and I was always a stock bond freak. You know, that's how I came up until I had mentors like Egon, private mentors like Egon, who taught me about the real value of money. And now instead of being a mentor, he's a colleague. But remember, decades ago, folks like Egon, he wasn't alone, but he was one of the pioneers who had made a lot of money on the public markets in a FTSE 100 company, recognized that it's the it's the currency's purchasing power that is the real issue given these debt cycles. When he was investing in gold, it was $200, $300. It's gone to 400 700 800 1100 1800 2000 It's always a subject of debate. It's just that silly little bar that stares at you from the ground and does nothing, that barbarous relic. And I would argue, and I've learned, and I have no doubt in my mind um, now, that all these currencies in circulation, whether they're mouse click printed, levered, hypothecated, buried in the repo markets, buried in the euro dollar markets, buried in the derivative markets, All these currencies that are spinning around and not sitting in the ground are losing value, whereas gold just sits there and it doesn't get stronger. It's just currencies get weaker. And yes, there's the COMEX trade. Yes, there's the LBMA banks. Yes, there's manipulation of the spot price of the paper price of gold. All those things are true. But at the end of the day, would you rather want would you rather want your fiat or digital joke currency at bank X, Y or Z 
Or would you rather want an actual bar of a finite asset with unlimited duration that you own in a private vault as opposed to a beleaguered bank? For me, Egon was right 20 years ago, and he'll be right again uh, tomorrow. It's just, as Rick Rule said, I think it was brilliant. He was talking about silver, but I think it's a true thing. When you step outside of all the smoke and noise, all the gun smoke, all the debates, QT, QE, inflation, deflation, markets, sectors, it's simply too much debt and too much debased currency and pro precious metals reward infrequently but extravagantly for the patient investor who's not a speculator who understands currency risk it's not a gold bug analogy it's not a gold bug narrative it's not a gold bug apology it's common sense and so it's really precious not metals are real assets or commodity cycles and portfolios we're not trying to sell a book we're selling conviction or this is my opinion and we'll talk about it. i'll answer the question but i think it's important not to be cynical it doesn't mean believe every word i say but this there's, I could be a Goldman Sachs selling bonds for a fee. I don't want to do that. Most of us could be doing that, but I don't believe in those bonds. I didn't do that when I was managing funds. And I'm, I came to precious metals and real assets only because in, in this particular environment, you've got to own an asset that can't be printed or manufactured at will, that has a kind of an infinite you know, infinite duration, but finite, site, you know, finite uh, supply. And so, no, I'm not going to say just, Go out and buy gold, you know, go buy, buy gold from us. It's not that simple. Gold is not sexy. It's not a speculation asset. I don't think it's the sexiest thing that every client or every person listening should be buying. I just see it as currency insurance for uh, currencies that are already dying. And I, I'll just say it in real simple terms, you know, I, when I was in high school, I played baseball. And if we had a really good pitcher or the other team had a really good pitcher, we knew who was going to win the game, who was pitching. Who was pitching? We had to go play through the motions, nine innings, six innings, looking at my watch, sitting on third base, waiting for the seven. But if we had the right pitcher, we were going to win. And it's really hard to say in anything in the markets that you're certain of something. In fact, the only thing that worries me is just how certain I am. I don't know a lot of things. I can't time a market. I do know that since 1971, when Nixon took away the chaperone of gold from the currency, that since 1971, every major currency has lost at least 95% of its value when measured against a real asset like physical gold. Again, whether you believe in gold or not, just look at the math. There's all kinds of cycles and trends and gold can go up and down. It's not Bitcoin, doesn't have a standard deviation of 170. I just know this, like I knew I had a good pitcher or a bad pitcher. I'm gonna win or I'm gonna lose. I know that gold is going to ensure my purchasing power better than a yuan, a dollar, a peso, a franc, or a euro. That's all I know. That doesn't mean everyone should put everything they have in gold. My first thing is just, it's a mathematical fact that currencies have lost 95% of their value since the, we closed the gold window in 71. That's just objective fact. Doesn't talk about volatility and prices. I own gold like every one of our clients as, as insurance against banking risk and currency risk. It's just that simple. And I feel high- Physical. And I yeah. like having possession of it or, you know, have it stored privately. Um, and uh, yeah, I was, know, I was sitting with Egon two days ago in Zurich. We were just watching. And again, I think cynics will say, well, he's a, here's a guy who works in Zurich with a private gold vault and he's got physical gold. Of course, he's going to have a bias. And of course, I have a bias. Sure. But we were thinking, and I do have a bias, but we were thinking, imagine if you and I Egan, had our money at Silicon Valley Bank. 250,000 insured, the rest gone, unless somebody bails us out. We have yeah. to typically, it would take two years in receivership to get a dividend on the non insured money to get pieces of the sold assets of that bank. But God knows the Fed and the FDIC came in and bailed it out again. They can't do that anymore. They won't be doing that forever, but they did then. But let's just assume in a normal scenario, your bank fails because it's got long duration risk and poor loans, like so many banks do. And believe yeah. me, they do. This is not the end of banking yes. risk in America. We didn't even get into that. It is not the end. And everyone knows that who knows banking. But that's not making the headlines because be calm and carry on is what's necessary. When the math is bad, keep the, the media in calm. But if imagine if, if it, let's just say for some math, it's a million dollars. You have a million dollars at SVB or you have a million dollars in gold at a hole in the ground somewhere in the world that you pay a fee for. And everyone laughs and makes fun of you for. But that gold is yours with a serial number allocated, segregated just for you. The, the manager of that vault isn't lending it out into the world in fractional reserve gold and putting it at risk so they can get bigger fees and bigger returns themselves. It's just sitting there. But it's always there. There's no line up outside the vault when the, when the bank fails because it's always there. It's just there. But people's memories are short. When bank runs, we had a 40 billion dollar bank run at SVB in 24 hours. That's insane. 
That's yes, insane. It yes, it <laughs> That's just the beginning. But I'm saying, if you just had a, even gold under your mattress, which we don't recommend, but even if you had that, that's better than 250000 or 400000 at a bank near you. And I hate to say that. That's not trying to be conspiracy theory. It's common sense. But we're not a bank. We don't loan. We don't margin. If you hold gold in a vault or you hold it in a, in a shoebox somewhere underground in the back of a farm, it's still safer than a lot of these regional banks. And frankly, even a lot of these too-big-to-fail banks. But you know, they are too big to fail in a lot of ways, as we saw with Credit Suisse. Viele Anleger sind ganz frustriert, wie sie, haben, wie sie haben schon erklärt. Und natürlich verstehe ich diese Frustration, aber ich bin nicht frustriert über Gold, ganz und gar nicht, und mit Silber auch. Ich war in Goldlagerjahren lange bevor ich Goldmanager in der Schweiz wurde. Für mich ist Gold einfach, weil Geschichte und Mathematik so ehrlich sind. Und ich mache mir keine Sorgen heutzutage, weil ich bin Goldanleger und kein Goldspekulant. Es gibt einen großen Unterschied. Und da ist der technische Goldpreis für mich nicht so wichtig. Wenn man die Geschichte und die Mathematik versteht, wird man ruhiger und geduldiger. Als Igan zum Beispiel unser Unternehmen gründet, lag der Goldpreis bei 300 Dollar. Heute liegt es bei 1900. Es ist um das Sexfache gewachsen und hat sich besser entwickelt als der S&P. Und doch sind viele Anleger immer noch frustriert, dass Gold nicht genug getan hat. Aber jedenfalls kann ich diese Frustration in gewisser Weise verstehen. Wir haben natürlich eine historische Schuldenblase, wir haben einen Krieg, wir haben Inflation. Warum liegt der Goldpreis nicht bei zum Beispiel 3000? Und meiner Meinung nach wird Gold viel höher als 3000 steigen. Einfach weil der Dollar und alle anderen Währungen letztendlich immer schwächer werden. Aber was bedeutet irgendwann? Und viele verlieren die Geduld, das verstehe ich. Sie wollen, dass Gold jetzt steigt und zwar heute. Aber Gold ist schon immer gestiegen, nicht in einer geraden Linie, aber der Trend ist offensichtlich. Währungen sterben nicht auf einmal, sie sterben langsam, wie ein überfordertes Armee. Aber sie sterben immer, sie sterben direkt vor unseren Augen, die Beweise sind überall. Es ist für mich mathematisch. Gold ist die offensichtliche Lebensversicherung gegen, gegen diesen langsamen Tod. Aber natürlich, der US-Dollar wird die langsamste Währung zu sterben sein, weil er die Weltreserve Währung ist. So ja, der Dollar wird nicht morgen oder nächstes Jahr sterben. Er wird nicht sterben wie der Peso in Argentinien. Er wird einfach schwächer und schwächer werden. Aber ja, ich bin froh, dass ich Wohlstand nicht in sterbenden und unendlichen Währungen, sondern in unsterblichen und unendlichen Geldmetalle messe. Und das ist für mich so einfach. Und ich weiß, dass viele Leute ihre Geduldigkeit äh, verlieren. Sie, 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 sie haben ein bisschen die Nase voll, die Nase voll mit dem Goldpreis. Mit der, für mich ist es, es ist nur eine Frage von, von Zeit und Geduldigkeit und eine, eine grundsätzliche Verständnis von Mathematik und Geschichte. Und ich bin ganz, ganz zufrieden jetzt mit Gold und ich habe keine Angst, für was in der Zukunft kommt, in Hinsicht auf Gold. Aber wie Sie haben schon erklärt, be careful what you ask for. Weil wenn wir wirklich Gold, äh, wenn Gold wirklich steigt, äh, das wird eine ganz, ganz schlimme Zeit für die ganze Welt sein. Und das ist leider die Wahrheiten, die die, die Vergangenheiten, die, die, die Zukunft, alles ist verbunden. Das haben wir schon vielmal gesehen in, das, in der Geschichte und das werden, das werden wir schon wieder sehen in der Zukunft. For gold. I look at gold probably different than some of your listeners or viewers because I stopped being a trader 20 years ago when I got very lucky on an IPO during the dot-com bubble and I didn't know a stock from a bond and I was running hedge fund. And uh, I had a good friend from high school and college. We were funded by his father. We made a lot of money on a pre-IPO and suddenly too dumb, too stupid, too young. I was responsible for actual money. Yeah. And when I realized I had that lottery ticket, like I see a lot of people getting, uh, you know, with Bitcoin too, when you, when you come into some money too young, you better learn how to manage it quickly. And that to me became my personality was more about preserving rather than making more. Yeah. I look at gold as an investment opportunity. I say it over and over. It's currency for already dying insurance. It's like getting a good premium on life insurance when you've already been diagnosed with a fatal illness. There's no doubt that since we decoupled from the gold standard, when Nixon welched on the Bretton Woods promise to have a world reserve currency backed by gold, that the purchasing power of the dollar, like every major currency since 1971, has lost over 95% of its value when measured against a milligram of gold. To me, that's not a gold bug apology or an excuse to come be a client of mine for a fee in Zurich. It's just common sense to preserve your wealth because whether you measure that in pesos or, you, or, or yen or euros or dollars or kroner, as I say it over and over, you're running uphill in roller skates because the inherent purchasing power of how you measure your portfolio, your checking account, your credit card statement is in currency that's losing its inherent purchasing power. Right. And since central banks, central banks in the West won't back that with gold, I have to become my own central banker. Whatever my net worth is, I have to have a portion of that 
gold backed myself. So I have to own private physical gold held outside of an incredibly fractured banking system, the symptoms of which have been everywhere and obvious lately. Um, and I have to become my own vault, my own private banker, my own central bank, because the Fed and the ECB and the Bank of Japan, the Royal Bank of Australia, they're not going to do it. Yeah, so schon erklärt, ich sehe eine Vermischung von mir, leider centralized control and auch central bank digital currency zum Beispiel, aber es wäre ein super Rückenwind for gold am Ende sein. Aber gleichzeitig ich kann auch kein Szenario in der Zukunft vorstellen, in dem Gold nicht eine sehr wichtige Rolle spielt. Der Glaube an Fiat-Geld in allgemein und sauberhaftiger digitales Geld ist vorbei und die Leute fangen an aufzuwachen. Es ist sehr, sehr wichtig, dass, dass wir uns zusammen die, die Wirklichkeit akzeptieren und, uh, und uh, informiert sein und vorbereitet sein. Das ist meine Schlüsselwert. Danke, ja. Matthew. Nothing, uh, I don't need to disparage other asset classes or disparage other strategies for those who understand market risk and risk assets or even cryptos. I'm absolutely fine with that. For me and for the clients that we have from over 90 countries all around the world, the great deal of AUM in Switzerland, our focus is very simple. It's an insurance product. It's a wealth preservation product. And we don't really look at the movement of price in gold every day. It certainly has been trending up since Egon bought it at 300. It can be volatile, but there is in my mind and in Egon's mind and all of our partners' minds, it's, it's, we don't have to worry about timing the market. We can very calmly be patient. Some people say it requires a monk's patience, but um, we know that debt crises are inevitable. We've seen a bunch already in the last couple of years which we can talk about. And we know that fiat currencies always revert to their paper value, which is zero. And that sounds sensational, but it's really not. It's literally, the evidence is all around us. And so gold can move up and down with uh, fluctuations in the COMEX market, the LBNA market, the, the mechanizations that go on there every day at 2.30 with the boot to the neck and the permanent short. But we know there's massive risk in the, uh, in the derivatives market. We know there's massive risk in the sovereign bond market. We know things are breaking already. They're going to continue to break. And gold doesn't rise. Currencies just embarrass themselves. They just get weak. Jahr gestraft wurde. Also ich denke, der, ja, der Weg nach oben ist wieder eingeschlagen, oder? Ja, und das ist vielleicht ein gutes Argument für Gold. Wie erwartet und tausendmal erklärt, Gold liebt Chaos, Währungsabwertung, Inflation von verrückter Geldpolitik und mehr Mausklick Geld und vermeintlicher Mausklick Geld. Die globale Zentralbanken in allgemein und die US-Notenbanken besonders werden gleich gezwungen sein, mehr wertlose Fiat-Geld auszudrücken. Das ist meine persönliche Meinung. Und wenn die Krise immer größer wird, die Entscheidungsträger können auch die Ausrede ausnutzen, eine große Reset anzufangen. Und diese Reset und Central Bank Digital Währung oder Currency werden keine Glaubwürdigkeit haben, ohne irgendwas für eine wichtige Rolle des Goldes. Das finde ich unvermeidlich auch. Niemand wird eine digitale Währung akzeptieren die nicht Gold gestützt ist. Die ehemalige Lügenillusion von Fiat Geld wird bald vorbei, vorbei sein, Jan, meine Meinung. To your other question about the US dollar and gold and tier one status and the Bank of International Settlements and these different Basel Accords and, and new rules and repricing gold or recalibrating gold, I think without getting all the complexity, it's very simple. Somewhere in the last few years, and certainly right now, what we're seeing in the last year is central banks are buying more gold and dumping more dollars. And that's just keep it simple, stupid. The big banks of the world, especially as you go east in, in the BRICS countries, are getting rid of treasuries, and that means they're getting rid of dollars. They're getting rid of Uncle Sam's IOUs because Uncle Sam has been at that bar stool for too long. His bar tab has gotten too big, and nobody wants his IOUs. So they're repricing the dollar. They're rethinking the dollar in Uncle Sam's treasury, and they're rethinking gold. And it's not a coincidence that as they're dumping treasuries, they're buying gold because they're thinking three or four moves ahead. The fun is no longer going to be in the markets or in the dollar. The, the, the reality is going to be in real real assets with real purchasing power. And again, I have a bias. I'm a gold executive in Zurich. It's not just a bias. It's a conviction, but I could be selling my book and that's, you got to disclose that, but I do believe this. But what I'm saying is it's like, again, trying to keep this simple. Think of the story we all know of the three little pigs. It's an American parable or fable about there's two pigs that have so much fun. They're building their house out of straw and the other one's building his house out of mud and they're going out partying every night and they're having a great time. They're playing the markets. They're playing the the nightclubs, you know, dating the right girls, whatever. Those two pigs are having a great time with their little straw and mud house. And there's this boring pig who's building his house out of brick because he heard that somewhere there's a big bad wolf coming. 
And the analogy is if I build my house out of bricks, when that big bad wolf comes, he can huff and puff, but he won't blow my house down. And in a way, speculation right now at a market top is like being that little piggy with the straw house or the mud house, that temporary prosperity that Hemingway talked about, that euphoria where, hey, man, markets are up. Fed has our back. This is our time to speculate. I'm going to be the little pig with the straw house. It's going to have fun. And what, what I'm saying is I do believe it's my opinion, like Ray Dalio's opinion and David Stockman's opinion, and God knows how many others out there. There's so many on those Kitcos and those wealthy ones that agree. That big bad wolf is coming. It's called a debt crisis. It's called a currency crisis. And the pig who has the house made out of bricks is going to beat the big bad wolf. The other little piggies with the straw houses, with those risk portfolios and those speculative assets are going to get eaten alive by that big bad wolf, that credit crisis, that crunch. In some ways, you could say Silicon Valley Bank was a pig with a straw house. JP Morgan is a pig with a brick house. It has more gold and it has more deposits. But whether you're JP Morgan or Silicon Valley Bank or a tech millionaire or you're waiting tables trying to invest in the markets right now, use your common sense. There's more risk coming to you than there is reward. There is a big bad wolf called a credit crisis, a credit contraction, a debt induced event coming. I do not know when it is. Nobody does. The signs are obvious. The shark fins are rising. The, the central bankers are more and more cornered, more and more desperate. That's why we see more political control. We see more problem, more phraseology, more platitudes, but really bad math. But I think that big bad wolf is coming. So regardless of what your profile is, I think build your house out of brick. That goes to my argument about gold. Again, I'm a gold guy, not a crypto guy. I'm not going to make fun of cryptos. I think gold is that. Well, gold loves chaos. As long as there's not chaos in the headlines, a lot of people who are newer to gold or look at it as a speculative asset just buy their time and the opportunity cost of being in gold when they can chase the trend in the equity markets is obvious to them. Most of, in fact, all of our investors are really going to look at gold as a speculative asset. They look at it as insurance against dying currencies. It's a hedge against the weakening purchasing power of the U.S. dollar in particular, but certainly in other currencies. But to your question about why there's this rally, again, that goes back to my point. There is a sense in the markets based on the yield curve analysis of certain futures contracts and certain um, market indicators that the Fed is going to be much more dovish this year. And that as we head into recession, they're going to have to reduce rates to stir growth. And since they see a recession, the irony is, in short, bad news is good news for the markets. Things are so bad at a debt level, at an interest rate level, at a kind of macro level that the Fed is going to be forced to be more dovish. If they're more dovish, that will be a tailwind for lower rates and more more liquidity. But when you look in, so that really is a tailwind. For the, well, gold loves chaos. As long as there's not chaos in the headlines, a lot of people who are newer to gold or look at it as a speculative asset just buy their time and the opportunity cost of being in gold when they can chase the trend in the equity markets is obvious to them. Most of, in fact, all of our investors are really going to look at gold as a speculative asset. They look at it as insurance against dying currencies. It's a hedge against the weakening purchasing power of the U.S. dollar in particular, but certainly in other currencies. But to your question about why there's this rally, again, that goes back to my point. There is a sense in the markets based on the yield curve analysis of certain futures contracts and certain um, market indicators that the Fed is going to be much more dovish this year. And that as we head into recession, they're going to have to reduce rates to stir growth. And since they see a recession, the irony is, in short, bad news is good news for the markets. Things are so bad at a debt level, at an interest rate level, at a kind of macro level, that the Fed is going to be forced to be more dovish. If they're more dovish, that will be a tailwind for lower rates and more, more liquidity. But when you look in, so that really is a tailwind for the equity markets. But when you look at the, at the banks, you know, you look at where they are, their balance sheets. I mean, banks right now are going to U.S. Treasury auctions rather than overnight reverse repo because they can use those U.S. Treasuries on the auctions as leverage because banks are, they have poor liquidity. They're, there's a liquidity crisis. And even banks are receiving less premiums for their swaps. Why? Because they can use those off the balance sheet because their balance sheets are bad. There's credit tightening. Credit and easy debt is the tailwind for Mer American growth and American bubbles. And so the banking, the banking system is stressed. It's contracting. But the markets are up because they think that is temporary. Powell will have no choice but to pivot. I think there's some truth in that, actually. But the irony is when we get the liquidity needed to avoid a liquidity crisis, because every crisis in the markets is a liquidity crisis. When you tighten liquidity, markets start to hiccup. There's an anticipation of liquidity. But if you create more liquidity, you do that to save the S&P or the credit markets, to monetize our treasury markets. Yes, you can save those, but it's always going to be at the expense of the underlying currency. And when that happens, when that becomes more palpable, 
that's when people start to realize their money, their currency is getting weaker. And that's when we get the phone calls and the emails to buy more physical gold. So it kind of cycles like an EKG. Equities up, interest in gold down, equities up, but currency values depleting, debasing. Then people start to realize, wow, I need to deal with the low purchasing power of my currency. No matter how relatively strong it is, they start thinking about insuring that with physical precious metals. Okay, thank you. Well, it's interesting. I think of Egon when he started Matterhorn, it was gold was at under $300. And uh, since that, that was in 2000, 1999, 2000, um, gold has gone up six times since then and has outperformed the S&P. And yet people still say gold's not doing enough for us. Gold's not doing enough for us because it's not a 25 or 3,000. It's boring. I can get so much more in Bitcoin or I can get so much more in, uh, you know, a SPAC or some immortal tech stock. And they're right. But when I look at what gold has done for Egon or for me, and I'm someone who's benefited from silly returns on an IPO that I could have never earned, and it was more money than my parents and grandparents and their parents earned in an afternoon. So yeah, that did a lot for me, but it really didn't do anything for me other than make me a lottery ticket winner. But what gold has done for me and Egon and all our clients is it's preserved the wealth that we had, whether we inherited it, earned it, or, or tricked into it. And so to me, that does a lot for me. And people keep, I think if you're a speculator and you're saying, well, gold's not at 2,800 yet, it's not doing anything. I, you know, again, well, if it's preserving the wealth that you have, because that wealth that's sitting in your portfolio, it may be going up, but the purchase power matters. And for me and for our clients, we're investors. My first responsibility, gold is doing just fine. In terms of where gold is going, uh, I don't even think it's best days have come. I don't like to speculate on price because you're still measuring that in some fiat fantasy currency. So when gold is at 5,000, fine, but it's still going to be 5,000 useless dollars, more debated dollars or kroner or euros or yuan. So it's a fair question and it will get higher. It doesn't mean it goes in a straight line, but the world, not just the dollar, but the world is a recurring picture and the dollar is in debt over its skis. It's inevitable. It is obvious. Uh, there is also, as I said earlier, no doubt that they're going to have to create synthetic liquidity to, liquidity to save the system. They will have to create more money to support the bond markets and the system itself. There's no doubt that in every market crash or every societal kind of crash where you have debt this level, the last bubble to pop is always the currency. And that, again, has happened from 1789 France to 1999 Yugoslavia to 1930s Deutschland or Germany. So gold will become um, an antidote to its, you know, anti-fiat and the dollar is king fiat. In terms of timing that, it's impossible. It's like saying, when will Germany invade Poland or when will, you know, it was 33, 34, 36, 38, 39. It really doesn't matter whether it was 36, 39, as long as you were out before September of 39. And to me, we buy gold because we don't know. We just see currencies openly Common dying. The question I hear regarding de-dollarization is what is the alternative if the world were to de-dollarize, what will they use instead? Exactly, and that's the point that Brent makes and many others that I agree with. It's not gonna be the ruble, the yen, it's not gonna be the peso, it's not gonna be the yuan. So in terms of world reserve currency, the US dollar is still supreme. It's just its hegemony has changed dramatically. And no, and yes, I'm a gold executive out of Switzerland. It's not going to be the gold bar either. It's not going to be a gold-backed currency. But what you're going to just see is what we're seeing in the last two years, central banks dumping U.S. treasuries and stacking physical gold at record high levels. And even investors, and we have investors that are high net worth and fairly sophisticated, they know there's not going to be a gold-backed currency. They're like the BRICS, but they can become gold-backed themselves. We can each become our own central banker from our own home or our own vault or our own uh, storage facility, however we choose. And that's what a lot of sophisticated investors do. And I'm not going to name names. I knew a lot of guys from Wall Street and the hedge fund world who are portfolio managers who trade in arbitrage, credits, equities, long, short, multi-strat funds. And they don't trade gold in their books that they take their two and 20 on. But when they have their own personal money, they invest in gold vaults somewhere outside of the U.S. And the smart money is basically trying to solve their own currency problem on their own. And, and retail investors are doing the same thing where they put in a shoebox or they put it in a private vault somewhere in the Swiss Alps, um, more and more people are catching on that the inherent purchasing power of their Canadian, Australian, American dollar, or of their Euro uh, or Kroner or French or Swiss franc uh, just isn't what it used to be. And it's going to continue to get weaker as uh, national decision makers debase their currency to pay off debt. When, when you say that gold is a wealth preservation tool, can you just elaborate on exactly what you mean? It, it's preserving wealth against what? Against the erosion of the value underlying currency because of inflation? 
uh, is it is it it's, protection it's against other currencies? Yeah. yeah, it's 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 not even a currency hedge against other currencies or currency arbitrage. It's just that it, it, I joke that it's fire insurance for houses that already on fire. I kind of joke about it. it's like the CDS to the MBS trade. When mortgage-backed securities were tanking, you went long CDS, just going long precious metals because it's like having flood insurance for a house that's already on the river and the water's rising. The inherent purchasing power of the currency is dying. It's burning in front of us. Despite the DXY or its relative strength, its inherent purchasing power gets weaker and weaker by the year. There are, there are spikes where current purchasing power can shift higher or lower. The dollar can go higher or lower. To Brent Johnson's point, I agree. But the long-term trend is when measured against gold, it just gets weaker. Not every day, not in a straight line, but historically, I would much rather own uh, my, I'd much rather preserve my wealth in a monetary metal than in a paper asset, even if it's the world reserve currency, because this world reserve currency is in, in a historical debt pattern that you can't get out of without debasing it even further. I think people have cognizant, cognitive dissonance. They still believe it's the bond market of 40 years ago or 10 years ago, or it's the U.S. dollar when Kissinger and Nixon before they welched. But it's not. We're just not that same country. And I'm an American. I'm a patriot. I love the iconic America, but I see a debt-soaked America, a debased currency, an unloved IOU, and a, and a monetary and fiscal policy that's completely at odds with themselves. And that's not to be doom and gloom. It's just it's to be as realistic as I can. In Switzerland, where I work out of, for generations have always held a massive percentage of their wealth in gold because they've seen wars, cycles, inflation, deflation. America and a lot of people younger, like my daughters or my son's age, have never really gone through a real inflation pain or a real insult to their purchasing power or a real political or financial crisis or even a military crisis on our shores. So there's a kind of out of sight, out of mind mentality, maybe the benefit of studying history or living overseas or living in Europe or looking at the purchasing power of my money has made me more cynical. Uh, but Again, my clients, our clients, they're not against speculation. They're not against trying to make money in other areas. There's not many areas to go to right now. But their role with us is just to preserve the purchasing power of their currency in something that isn't paper. And uh, what they do with the rest of their money is up to them. And what I do with the rest of my money is, frankly, at this point in my life, I'm not looking at speculation. I'm just trying to preserve it. I don't trust paper money. That's that simple. When fear and chaos come to the world, people go to something familiar, that old life raft that they were taught about from their grandfather, that boring, barbarous old you know, relic gold, that pet rock. But, you know, central banks throughout the world aren't just collecting gold because it's a pet rock. I think they're collecting gold because they don't trust paper money and they don't trust monetary and fiscal policy at the leading at the leading developed economies anymore. And so um, I, I think, you know, gold is rising despite, a, you know, the DXY is at 106. I know it was at what, 112 in last October. The dollar, to Brent's point, is still the best horse in the glue factory. It's still the best currency in the world. But despite a strong dollar, despite rising yields despite FFR rates where they are in the last 18 months, gold is being incredibly resilient. And now it's actually approaching all time highs, not there yet. And, and I'm not here to tell you when, um, but uh, it's fascinating. I think it's a combination of fear. It's a combination of chaos. It's a combination of lack of distrust in the American narrative in general, politically, socially, et cetera. It's also a lack of trust in the American dollar longer term. I mean, Rick, um, uh, it was a James Turk is talking about default risk in the US. I don't see default risk. I just see a, a, a continually uh, get, continuing to get to the point where they're going to have to print more money to support those bonds and keep those yields under control. That will be inflationary. That will debase the currency. And I think people are realizing what's what's the U.S. going to do? Where is it going to get its growth from? What kind of GDP? We need 30, 40 percent GDP annually to get us back. We need to cut spending by 70 percent. It's never going to happen. So those who just look at the simple, stupid metrics of debt and spending don't see any way out for the dollar, but something Japanese where they're going to have to debase even the world reserve currency to support an over its ski debt problem, an unprecedented debt problem. And, and, and then we have a DC that can't even agree party to party or among parties and is going to do more spending next year. We simply are spending more than we make tax receipts and GDP don't pay for it. Currency is going to be debased. Again, we've had backdoor pivots to the BTFP, to the Treasury Department. We're going to have outright pivots or outright yield control, yield curve control eventually. And I'm not talking 30 years from now. I'm talking in the next few years or even the next few minutes. I don't know. No one really does. But you don't need to be a weatherman to look out of the horizon and say, those are gray clouds. I got to get an umbrella and rubber boots on today. I don't know if it's going to rain at noon or 1230 or 3.30. I just need to prepare for the rain. And I don't know. What will be the headline? Will it be Martians? Will it be COVID? Will it be another pandemic? Will it be some other bad guy in the world? But the real problem with the U.S. dollar isn't the BRICS. It isn't Putin. It isn't COVID. It's our policymakers. Generation. 
since 71 that welched on the gold backed currency, got rid of the chaperone. We've been spending more to get reelected or get Nobel Prizes by printing money out of thin air. It's not sustainable policy. A 10 year old could see that eventually if you just look at the math. I'm not trying to be flippant, it just doesn't work. And I'm not trying to be dramatic either because I don't think it's the end of the dollar. It's not the end of America. It's not the end of civilization. It's just not going to be the same 10 years as it was the last 10 years. And it's not the same dollar and it's not the same IOU. And the evidence is overwhelming. It's not even predictable. It's happening right now. The evidence of a soft landing is not here. The evidence of a hard landing is everywhere. Uh, the fact that gold is rising in this environment proves that people don't trust these currencies and IOUs. Right. And I know when, when Egon started investing in gold in 2020, Egon Von Greyer is my partner. Um, gold was at $300. It's now almost at 2000 a day. It's had its sideways moments, its rises and falls. But he would argue that it actually has outperformed the S&P. On an inflation-adjusted basis, depends on what definition of inflation. But I don't need to be an apologist on the debate of gold versus, say, cryptos or others. I'm not against these views. I have a simple policy, a simple view. The inherent purchasing power of the U.S. dollar since we went off the gold standard in 1971 has fallen by 98% when measured against a milligram of gold. I'm not going to measure my gold vis-a-vis -vis the CPI scale from the Bureau of Labor Statistics because I think it's an open lie. Everyone on Wall Street knows that. We're under-reporting and misreporting inflation by, by a multitude. But I just know this much that no currency, no paper currency gives me more confidence than physical gold. So I don't even look at how you price gold, what, in US dollar? Look at it in the yen today. Look at it in the dollar. Look at it in the euro. Look at it in the Turkish lira. It, it, it's just that I don't have faith in paper currency. You get away from CPI. You get away from inflation. Look at paper money versus monetary money, and gold will be your best asset as a wealth preservation mindset. If I were looking purely at speculation, I'd be long crypto all day long just on a speculation asset because it has the same philosophical thesis as precious metals in many ways. The argument for crypto is that it's a finite asset infinite duration but finite supply it's portable etc it's a better alternative than paper currency the problem i have with it and i'm not against it guys like larry leopard and, and ronnie sturf who i respect are very pro crypto i'm not anti-crypto i'm just i'm not in the speculation game most of the time i think the people i've known who've done well in crypto have never done it for the philosophical reasons that they're worried about their currency they just see an incredible speculation play that has a good story behind it and i hope crypto does well i'm more boring I'm not looking for speculation. Our clients at Matterhorn, they can speculate in other areas of their lives or other areas of the profession. They're just trying to preserve the euros, Canadian, American dollars. We've got clients from 90 countries in different currencies. They just know their paper currencies are getting weaker, and they're just trying to keep that uh, hedged with gold because gold doesn't rise. Fiat currencies just get weaker, and that's my main argument for it. It's not about comparing scales or, or time frames or inflation adjusted or what the S&P did in a given window. You can use statistics to make just about any point you want. It's just getting weaker. Fiat currencies are just getting weaker. And so what can the typical man, the typical Unternehmer do ihr ihr Geld oder ihr Währung zu verteidigen? Natürlich, meiner meine Meinung nach, ist Gold eine Antwort. Das ist eine Alternative. Es gibt viele Leute, die glauben auf Bitcoin oder Krypto. Ich habe nichts dagegen Krypto, aber die Zentralbanken heutzutage, sie kaufen nicht Krypto, sie kaufen, sie kaufen physisches Geld, Gold, Entschuldigung. Warum? Uh, sie haben eine starke Meinung von Gold aus von der US Treasury oder der US Dollar oder der Yen oder Euro oder die anderen Währungen. Und für mich, das ist nur die Tatsache heute. Wir sehen, dieser Misstrau gegenüber die, die Fiat Money, dieser Papiergeld, dieser große Misstrau gegen unsere Entscheidungsträger. Und tatsächlich, diese, Gesten, diese große Misstrau gegen unsere Politiker, links oder rechts. Sie haben keine einfache Lösung. Und daher müssen uns jeder unsere private Zentralbank für uns selbst sein. Das müssen, wir müssen unsere Währung mit Gold gedecken. Verstehen Sie, was ja, ich meine? Ja. Auf Deutsch ist es ziemlich schwer, das zu erklären. Aber ich habe keine, keine Hoffnung, dass meine Zentralbank oder die ECB werden eine goldgedeckte Währung haben. Es ist zu teuer, es ist zu politischer. Und wenn Gold zu hoch geht, das ist eine große Merkmale, dass unser System in Dirk ist eine, ist eine Failure, es ist, eine, es ist Dirk gefallen. Ja. Und daher ist es wirklich peinlich zu sagen, Gold geht zu hoch und wir müssen nicht goldgedeckte Währung haben. Aber das kann ich tun, das kann sie tun. Wir können uns alles etwas Gold kaufen. Das heißt nicht, sie müssen reich sein. Und das heißt auch nicht, dass Gold die Antwort für alles ist. Die politische 
Probleme. Wir sind eine, in dieser sozialen Ruhe. Es ist, die Kultur ist total Zerrissenheit geworden. Ich, ich habe keine Antwort für alles. Aber in Hinsicht auf meine Währung und meine Vermögenszustand, am wenigsten könnten wir alles ein bisschen physisches Gold kaufen. Reich oder arm, mittelschicht oder hock. Wir können alles etwas tun, unsere Währung zu verteidigen. Gold, in, in, that's a large question. It's the most important question. But it also hinges on the currency question, which we have to talk about. Gold, there's a lot to say about gold. Um, for the, for the simple answer to your question is, if there's a ripping bull market based on a word-driven Fed, where, again, words replacing math, resilient, we're supportive, dovish, rate cuts, whatever the Fed wants to say, if you want to believe a lie long enough, you'll believe it, and markets will trade on that. If the S&P is ripping, there's an opportunity cost for speculators. Speculators will invest in equities rather than physical precious metals. Our clients, every single one of them, never call and ask about the gold price, even when it was reaching all-time highs. They don't care because they don't use gold as a speculation tool. So it's a different question how you answer. It's not an apology for gold. Gold is a wealth preservation asset insuring against dying inherent purchasing power of the currency, regardless of the relative strength of DXY. Gold is just real money, fiat paper money. Even the, even the DXY's leading number, the U.S. dollar, even when it's relative and stronger, the best patient in the ICU is still losing inherent purchasing power. So for our gold investors who are looking at wealth preservation, gold is 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 bought for that reason. They're not worried about opportunity cost or getting a better yield or a better return in the in the risk asset markets. But yes, if if stocks are ripping, speculators will dump ETF gold and go into higher higher performing stocks and follow the fangs or follow the big seven, et cetera. And that's fine. That's fine if you're a speculator. For wealth preservation asset, it's it's, it's indifferent. But gold's a, gold's a very long conversation. What's happening this year and what happened in 2023 is fascinating. I think the most important thing that I was looking at, and there are probably six or seven points, but when gold went above 2100 and then came back down to you know the 2000s, what was fascinating is on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, the premiums actually went up 3% because that's an indicator that this game in London and New York of putting a permanent boot to the neck of the gold price, the spot gold price through OTC futures contracts is slowly coming to an end because you can't, because there's there's a movement east in gold and there's a movement east in exchanges, there's a movement east in interest because of the lack of faith in the US dollar and the US treasury. You know, West can't, can't cap gold while China lets it rip. You, you're not going to see a 200 day moving average in the US dollar price of gold. It's going to be significantly lower than the 200 day moving average in the Chinese or the yuan price of gold. So. There's a there's a, the fundamentals are slowly returning to the gold market. That's very important. Central banks are on pace this year to buy another thousand tons of gold this year after a record year, year last year. I've said in many conversations, this is important when you're watching central banks net sellers of U.S. Treasury since 2014 and net and record breaking buyers of physical gold. To me, it's common sense. Again, keep it simple. Watch the big picture. If you were to sit and watch. As I've said before, cannons and horses and tents and soldiers and bayonets marching towards a border at a massive level, that would be common sense that something's about to change, either defense or offense. If you see central banks dumping Uncle Sam's IOUs at record levels and stacking physical gold at record levels, that's suggesting the troops are coming to border because they're expecting change. They're losing faith in a declining asset from a bad credit. They're losing faith in the U.S. dollar. They're losing faith in the U.S. Treasury because our debt levels are so grotesquely high, because they know that the only way to sustain the U.S. markets and the bond markets is through synthetic liquidity down the road. We always go from a pause to a rate cut to QE at some point, like we did 2018. Powell tried the same template, cutting rates, cutting the raising rates while cutting the balance sheet. By New Year's Eve in 2019, markets were seeing 1,000 basis point gyrations. By September of 2019, we saw a repo market crash, which is based on higher rates and yields and, and debt costs. By 2020, we saw the S&P tanking. That was a bond crisis, not a COVID crisis. But they hid a backdoor bailout behind COVID. Again, this movement, it's, it's a vicious cycle. They're cornered either way. They have a choice between saving the system or saving or killing the currency. They will debase the currency through super QE, as Luke Groman calls it, to eventually have to sustain the bond market. Right now, they're cutting rates. That's a very temporary bullish measure. But the gold markets are moving, changing. And, you know, right now, you know, you're seeing, you're seeing a, a whole new oil and gold trade in, in, in Chinese yuan. You can see China buying, you know, oil from Russia and paying for that in yuan, which then Russia can, can then 
convert to gold and they're stacking gold. You're seeing massive arbitrage trades right now. You could sell oil in London, use it to buy gold, take that gold to a Chinese trade hub, convert that gold into yuan and then buy oil in a currency outside of the US dollar. You have Saudi Arabia right now, which is doing more trade with China than it does with the US and the European Union combined. There are massive implications of that. Again, not making headlines today, not affecting the S&P today. These are the slow mm -hmm. undercurrents. But if Saudi Arabia, which is already a talking partner with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, is already a part of this BRICS new bank, the development bank, they're getting their house in order. This isn't Libya and Iraq. And we knew what happened when Libya and Iraq tried to sell oil outside of the U.S. dollar, whether it was in gold or euros. Gaddafi and, and Saddam Hussein are proof of how dangerous that can be. Saudi Arabia is not as afraid. Again, I'm not saying the petrodollar ends tomorrow, but these are seismic, seismic shifts. And I think, you know, young Chinese right now are buying gold more than tech stocks. They're five plays ahead of U.S. investors. They're thinking chess, not checkers. Right now, Pavlovian, we're following the Fed. We're following the trend. We're buying in the stocks. The markets are ripping. Divorce from all reality. You're also seeing that the highest sharp ratio macro on the planet right now is gold. It's much less volatility, much longer return. We're going into commodity cycles, like super cycle. I do believe this, but I think what's even more interesting about gold, because you asked about gold, we look at gold, is, is gold is a measure of the distortion and dishonesty in the financial markets right now. It's a measure of this disconnect. I mean, typically, you know, gold only loves negative rates, a weak dollar and low yields, and yet it reached all time highs on positive rates of 2%, a strong dollar and high yields. When, you know, what's this pet rock? When you can get no yield on a pet rock, you get 5% of the 10 year a few months ago. Why would you buy gold? And yet gold is reaching new highs. I think that's happening because no one really, the sophisticated money who's looking at preservation and not speculation, really trusts the US Treasury, the US dollar like they used to. It's not, it's not the same because there are internal problems and external problems in the US dollar. Trust is very, very hard to quantify. And I'm an American, I'm a patriot. Like you, I've lived most of my life outside of the country I was born in. But I grew up on baseball and apple pie, the American dream, the American education, the hard work ethic. I'm very proud of America. I don't recognize it from what it was 20 mm. years ago or even 10 years ago. And I think these are the things that Europeans, Middle Easterners, Asians, even Latin Americans are starting to figure out. First of all, internally, America is divided in, 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 into so many things. But what we've got is we've got we've got this this failure, this intellectual, this series of failed wars that, that we were like Condoleezza Rice said that Russia ran out of money before the West ran out of energy. So the West followed us into these ridiculous myopic sanctions against Russia, which completely backfired. Poland's going nuclear, Germany's in a recession and they're burning coal. So that was a, that, that was a lie, that didn't work. That plan didn't work. That failed war in Ukraine didn't work. That failed war in Afghanistan didn't work. A series of failed wars. We have a weaponized Department of Justice. We have a fourth estate that is so far from Woodward and Bernstein. We've got open censorship and Google, YouTube, and frankly, you know, anything. So I'm saying it's, it's, we don't trust. Internally, we don't trust. And externally, I've got news for Americans in the U.S. The rest of the world, including people who love America, don't respect America the same way. In general, because of political and social and financial policies and military policies, but they most importantly don't trust Uncle Sam's IOU because it's from a bad credit that's over its skis and debt at record levels. And they don't trust the US dollar in the same way. We're seeing a clear sign of commodity markets de dollarizing, which we can get into. There's a big debate about the degree and speed of that. I agree it's not going to happen overnight. But there have been seismic shifts, as Grant Williams and yeah. I warned, ever since that myopic policy that when we weaponize the dollar, we right. shot ourselves in the foot. And so many, many, many interesting and valid points you made there, Matthew. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I hear you. I am an American patriot. I grew up outside the U.S. but moved here mm -hmm. and a very proud American citizen and, and came here for those values that America is supposed to represent, mm -hmm. freedom and liberty and the pursuit of the great American dream. And as no. you're saying, we're seeing, you know, tremendous shifts in that. And you touched on so mm -hmm. many important points. And I would like to highlight that one of the things that you pointed out in one of our previous conversations was what you're seeing as the bifurcation of the global monetary system. And you mm -hmm. highlighted that a watershed moment was February of 2022 with sanctions against Russia mm -hmm. for its invasion of Ukraine, the dollar being mm -hmm. weaponized, Russia taken off the SWIFT system. And yes, I hear you that this is all in the grand scheme of things, the bigger picture. 
-hmm. But, you know, we did see big moves from BRICS this year to trade in their own mm -hmm. currency, not to use the dollar, mm -hmm. as you quite rightly mentioned, the petrodollar looking a tad precarious with the oil being paid for in yuan, in rupees, mm -hmm. in, in rubles. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, just this week, we had a former advisor to the People's Bank of China calling for China to reduce its holdings in U.S. treasuries due to increasing risks associated with American debt. Very vocal. It's one thing to think it, but it's another thing when China actually starts to say it out loud. And um, Yu Yongdin said that uh, China should not reinvest in U.S. bonds and notes upon their maturity and also pointing to the declining interest of foreign investors in U.S. Treasuries. Now, I know you have a chart which we'll be pulling up that shows how central banks have been dumping U.S. Treasuries and mm -hmm. buying gold. My question, mm -hmm. though, you, you touched on this idea of there being a premium between mm -hmm. gold in dollars and gold in other currencies. Now, gold mm -hmm. is still priced in dollars, mm -hmm. and therefore it's usually suppressed due to the strength mm -hmm. of the dollar. We're mm -hmm. starting to see that change, as we just touched on, in the oil market. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that we may be seeing more of a, a change in how gold is priced if it's moving away from the U.S. dollar as, as the denomination somehow? Yes. And again, viewers want to see it happen tomorrow. And we talked maybe over a year ago about the Moscow world standard. You know, we were yeah. thinking this was yep. going to happen with this new, you know, Glasiev and Babokov, and that was still years out. But now the Shanghai Gold Exchange is repricing gold. And again, because gold and oil post sanctions are now traded more vigorously outside of the U.S. dollar, this, again, is not an overnight process. But it was a death by a thousand cuts when Nixon went up the gold standard and neutered the U.S. dollar. Compared to the U.S., you know, compared to a milligram of gold, the U.S. dollar, like all of the major currencies of the world since 1971, have lost 95 to 98 percent of their purchasing power compared to gold. That was death by a thousand cuts. Again, the DXY can go up 25 percent to spend trillions in QE, but its inherent purchasing power has gone down. That's the key. A million dollars 10 years ago doesn't buy what a million dollars does a day, or hundred dollars 10 years ago, hundred dollars a day. That's death by a thousand cuts. This move away from the dollar, whether it's on the SGE or on the Moscow World Standard, is now happening. They're repricing gold more fairly in the East than they are in London or New York. I'm not saying that you're not going to see COMEX and CTX abuse the open fraud, the open price fixing that goes on in the LBMA banks. I'm not saying that ends tomorrow, but it's slowly shifting because, again, you can't price gold cheap, you know, below its real value in the U.S. or London exchanges while it's ripping in the Chinese exchange or eventually maybe a Russian exchange. Again, not tomorrow, not next week, but eventually you're going to see a return to fundamentals in the gold price. In the meantime, you still have the problem, or not the problem, the issue of the U.S. dollar and the de-dollarization theme. Again, I had a great discussion with Brent Johnson. I agree. Let's not kid ourselves. The U.S. dollar is, 80, is measured at 80% of GDP or 70% of GDP. It's 80% of trade settlements. There is a massive straw sucking on the milkshake of need and demand for U.S. dollars. It is the supreme currency. You know, it's needed for the euro dollar markets. It's needed for the regular markets. It's still needed for the oil markets. I'm not saying the DXY goes to 70 the, the, the issue I had with Brent Johnson is I don't see it going to 150 either. Again, this is because de-dollarization is a debate right now. It's an issue. It's a matter of degree. But, you know, when, when you do see China buying oil from Russia and Yuan, that's important. When you see 44 BRICS countries doing trade settlements outside U.S. dollar, that's an issue. When you see Saudi Arabia doing more trade with Europe, with China than with Europe and the U.S., when, again, it's death by a thousand cuts with the dollar's hegemony. Again, it took 50 years since the day I was born to see the dollar get so neutered compared to gold because of that fiat death compared to gold because of all the inflation and debasement of the currency over those decades. It's the same death by a thousand cuts of the hegemony and supremacy of the U.S. dollar because the world is moving away from that U.S. dollar. But the most important reason, I think, that the milkshake theory, which I, for which I have a tremendous amount of respect and agree mostly with, that there's this huge global demand for the world reserve currency that's immense power. The DXY is not going to tank. The dollar is not going to disappear. But the one thing, although the, 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 the milkshake theory in that straw has massive power, it doesn't have immortal power. And again, for people that are investing longer term, you have to realize that there may be a great big sucking sound, as Ross Perot would put it, but on the milkshake theory, this idea that the world is sucking demand for the U.S. dollars to prop the U.S. dollar and the DXY up. 
The flip side of that is there is no straw or super sponge for U.S. Treasuries. It's going the opposite. Mm. The world is stepping away from U.S. Treasuries. If America is printing out $20 trillion over the next 10 years in U.S. Treasuries and there's no buyers for it outside of the U.S. or outside of the Fed, what's the, what's the world going to do to keep yields c- controlled, to keep yields from going too high for Uncle Sam to pay for it? They're going to have to print money. I'm sorry. They're going to have to have super QE to pay for those IOUs. That ultimately debases the dollar. So there may be a strong demand for the currency, but there's no demand for the IOU. There's not a discussion about that. So what are countries going to purchase, if not U.S. Treasuries? I see the trend. You, we're going to pull mm-hmm. up a chart which clearly shows the trend mm-hmm. away from U.S. Treasuries. What are they mm-hmm. buying? I mean, we know central banks are buying record gold, but where are they putting their, their assets? So this What's is something the... that Brett and I talked about, too. I mean, it's, uh, and there's no easy answer. First of all, they're buying or settling in, in, in U.S. dollars, but then they're not holding in U.S. dollars. They're going to other assets. They're buying foreign products. They're buying Chinese products or they're, or they're covering the gap in gold. They're arbitraging the gap in gold. I'm not saying we're going back to a gold-backed currency. I'm not. What is probably likely is things get that bad when it just becomes so obvious that Uncle Sam's issuance of IOU so outpaces demand as it already is. But when it becomes ridiculous, when we are in a recession officially, again, Mm -hmm. too late because we're already in the funeral home, not in the doctor's office anymore. And they're going to tell us we're sick. It's too late when we're in an official recession. But when that supply of U.S. Treasuries becomes so great that there isn't enough sucking sound for those IOUs, uh, we'll probably see some type of, as the IMF warned us in 2020, some type of Bretton Woods 2.0, in which the the the, the, the folks, I want to say morons, who put us into this debt crisis over the last 15 years, will blame this debt crisis on COVID, on Putin, on maybe Martians, on global warning, anything but the bathroom mirror. They will not take responsibility for getting elected and Nobel Prizes by going in further and further into debt, issuing more and more IOUs that more and more of the world doesn't trust anymore. Like anyone who asks for too much money and keeps borrowing because they're addicted, if you're a good friend, you're going to stop lending them the money. Or if you're thinking about your own survival, you're going to look for other ways to spend your money than giving it to uh, a a country that really doesn't have a credible bond market. For now, Powell's going to try and reduce rates probably in 2024 to bring bond prices up so that maybe there'll be more demand for it, even (laughs) in Saudi Arabia. But again, it's too little too late. That sounds sensational. And maybe it's just me talking my gold book because... But gold goes up or down, or gold goes up whether the dollar is weak or strong, whether rates are high or low, or whether yields are positive or negative. Because deep down, gold gets the last patient smile because it's real money. This other stuff is debased, kind of Mexican standoff with each other. I trust you, you trust me. But it's just clear and clear that it's getting more and more debased. There's less and less demand for it. So countries are going to find ways to basically, like the BRICS are doing, and the list of BRICS nations are getting bigger. Again, the BRICS are not going to have a gold-backed currency. They're not going to replace the dollar. The ruble's not going to replace the dollar. The yuan's not going to replace the dollar. The kroner of the Swiss franc's not going to replace the dollar. The dollar's just going to be less, less hegemonic. We're going into a multipolar world, which is multi-dysfunctional. They'll probably do a Bretton Woods 2.0, as I said, try to restructure debt and currencies in a mixture of like the Plaza Accords and Bretton Woods 2.0. It won't be, it won't be, um, I would say smooth. It will be very volatile. And that's uh, that's what I see. But in the intro, we're going to see pause, pivot, QE, excuses, IMF, World Bank, Bretton Woods 2.0, massive failure of accountability, massive failure of responsibility, and finger pointing towards everyone but the bathroom mirror of the Fed officials, right. the central bankers, and the, and, the, and the folks who put us in this mess, and the politicians. I'm sorry. It's just how I see it. Firstly, in the short term for Mm -hmm. gold in 2024, we did reach a record Mm -hmm. high in 2023. Mm -hmm. What what Mm -hmm. do you see for gold 2024? I think, you know, when we last talked, I think gold was at 1,600. You asked me what it'd be, I said it'd be significantly higher. And now we're at 2,000, 2,100. That doesn't mean we're going to be at 2,500 the next time we speak. Gold never was in a straight line. I mean, if there's a massive bull run in the S&P because of at least the promise of a rate cut, by the way, that just tells you how absurdly powerful the Fed is in terms of risk assets. Just the carrot of a rate cut has already got the market giddy. I think that's almost embarrassing, but that's how the world is right now. But it will probably have an actual rate cut, but we'll also probably have a recession officially recognized by the NBER in 2024. And don't ask me when they'll do it. In my opinion, again, the evidence of a hard landing from Oliver Anthony to the M2 money supply to the deflation forces near term, because those deflation forces are inevitable given the M2 money supply. 
we're going to see subsequent to that massive inflation because we're going to have to print synthetic money to pay for our IOUs in a recession. So we'll probably see a bull market. We're already seeing an evidence of a bull market in the S&P. And that can take attention away from the gold market temporarily because there's an opportunity cost in investing in gold. If you're a speculator, you're going to invest in the S&P in a trending asset class. And if we have another rate cut, but you're, it's, that's why it's, there's cross currents because you've got a, an accommodated dovish Fed right now, only dovish because they're desperate because the real economy and the S&P is so broke and so in debt that they have to cut rates because of the repricing of bonds this year. It's really an oxymoron. The reason we're seeing a dovish Fed is because things are so bad right now. We haven't even hit target 2% inflation. And we're already talking about cuts, not just an extended pause. That's, again, you have to look 180 degrees from what Powell says and what he actually means. They're not the same thing. And this is not me being conspiratorial. The MO of the Fed and the track record is literally the worst on Wall Street. Almost nothing they say is as accurate as what they do. Powell is pivoting now, or at least talking about a pivot, because things are so bad in the S&P. The debt nature of 93% right. of these companies are still poor. But to your question, gold could still go up even if the markets rip temporarily, because sophisticated gold investors are not looking at the S&P. They're looking at the purchasing power of their respective currency, and it's getting weaker and weaker because the debt levels are getting higher and higher. And that's why I can afford to be agnostic or no fun at a party because I don't measure my wealth by the S&P. And I'm not making fun of people who do. I got lucky speculating in the NASDAQ and the dot-com bubble. So I believe in speculation. I understand why people go further and further on the risk branch for more reward. I'm not mocking investors following an obvious tailwind on a dovish Fed. Mm -hmm. I would do the same thing. But for sophisticated gold investors that really should determine the gold price, not the ETF price, not the spot price, but the actual physical value of gold, we're going to go into a recession in 2024 at the same time we're seeing a bull market at the end of 2023 on the S&P because things are so broken. So if we go into a recession, everything gets hurt, by the way. Markets go down. Gold can be very sympathetic. The spot price of gold can be very sympathetic. When the S&P goes down, we've seen that over and over. You see a temporary fall and then a rip north. But I don't look at the S&P or measure gold by the stock market or even by fiat money. I measure it in grams and ounces. And that's not an apology because I work in gold in Switzerland. I chose gold. Again, I could be flogging bonds for Goldman Sachs. I couldn't do it with a good conscience. I couldn't. Nobody at Matterhorn could. But I'm saying I understand that people need to take some risk in these markets and they should follow a dovish tailwind. But, you know, there is a clear sign, the fulcrum, the Pavlovian fulcrum, risk on, risk off, Fed dovish, Fed hawkish. I think Powell will uh, have a lot of influence either through words or through actions. will send the market up. Gold could go down if the S&P really rips. It could. But it doesn't worry me or my investors because we're not looking at gold as a comparison. I, to the I, I get all of that, Matthew, and all of those are very, very, very valid points. But for our viewers... Mm -hmm that mm -hmm. want some kind of price target from you. And I get that in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. But in the interim, while we are yep. still pricing gold in fiat, in US mm -hmm. dollars, do you have a range that you're looking at for 2024? Uh, I mean, look, all of us in the industry are basically looking at 2100 to 2300 in, okay. in, in a recession. Um, and, and, and I really don't want to, I don't want to look like an apologist, but I want to be sincere. I can only tell you what I think. I think it, it is, it's a fair question, and I'm very bullish on gold. But again, you don't get rich on gold. If gold right. goes to 2800 or goes to 5000 it's like Rick Rule says. I'm not sure he entirely means it. He's afraid gold goes to 5000 because that means a loaf of bread is going to be fifty to $500. In other words, right. when gold goes up, that means that everything else is in the oh, uh, Kissinger. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We'll get into the actual facts of that in a second. But there's really two parts to your question. Is Switzerland and other places still the safest place? And where do you hold your gold? That's your counterparty risk. It's going to be national. You know, you mentioned Singapore. We have a major vault in Singapore. We have a major vault in Zurich. We have another one in a non-disclosed location in the Swiss Alps, which is the safest vault in the world. But as we mentioned, Switzerland isn't what it used to be. It was very disappointing to see them tow the Western line during the Ukraine sanctions. That was a shock for Swiss and non-Swiss residents. And we spend a lot of time looking at jurisdictions. The simple answer is we can put gold anywhere in the world where any client wants it. We still, having looked at all the other horses, so to speak, have chosen Singapore and Zurich and, and Switzerland in general as the best jurisdictions. 29% of the gold exports 
or 29% of Swiss exports are gold, and 70% of the gold that is refined comes out of Zurich. It's essential to the Swiss economy that gold is a protected asset, notwithstanding Switzerland bending the knee to, to the West and to the U.S., We've looked at so many other jurisdictions. We're highly convinced. Maybe you could say biased, but still, we wrestle with this. There's no doubt in our mind that Switzerland is very, very safe. And Singapore is considered the Zurich or the Switzerland of the East. And we have a big vault in in, in Singapore for clients who want to have that in an Asian locale. But you know, again, with our logistics and our infrastructure, if we have a client who doesn't want to be in Switzerland or doesn't want to be in Singapore, we can put it just about any place in the world. The, ma- the major question is if you're owning physical gold, you definitely, to that confiscation or regulation issue, it's very important not to hold gold in your own national jurisdiction. There are still privacy rights that are existing in Switzerland that are superior to your privacy rights, say, in Idaho or Michigan or Tennessee, if you're an American holding physical gold there. Uh, there is no perfect answer. There's just relatively better answers. Yeah. So we're quite confident with Singapore and Zurich or Switzerland, but other jurisdictions we can accommodate.